completely unreadable. Uh, he also wrote uh, wonderful poems about the Civil War, um, one of which uh, is, there's one called The College Colonel, about this, uh, the people in the kid's hometown in western Massachusetts. He's come back from the war, and they have a little, they have a parade for him. And there's a band and the, an old men doff hat to the boy. He's on his horse. It's, but to him, the kid, there comes alloy. You know what alloy is? It's, 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 it's nothing pure. It's like an alloy mixture. It's not that an arm is lost. It's not that a leg is maimed. Uh, all of those things he has long taught himself to sustain. But all through the Seven Days fight, which was, which was a big battle, and, and uh, the darkness of Libby, which was another battle, and wilderness grim, there came, ah, heaven, what truth to him. Um, and people who have known the kind of uh, annihilation of of meaning and that uh for example is the poet Kierkegaard describes, you know, or that people experience in war or I think I may have shared with some of you the experience of uh burying myself in a strange country in a grave uh outside Cuernavaca. I had sold my identity six months before and and uh then came to be in this finca in this Guy croaked this fucking myopic chemist and uh, uh, who not only had bad vision, but on that particular evening, peritonitis, and his girlfriend, a, a deep thinker named Yum Yum, decided to give him an enema to relieve his peritonitis and kill him. And because we were down there under circumstances which prevented a timely visit to the emergency room, uh, we didn't intervene until he was good and dead. And then I was digging his grave in the back. And uh, I figured, uh, you know, sentimentally, well, let me get his ID, you know, and I'll drop it in a mailbox if I ever get back to America. So, and it was me. Because I had sold my ID like six months before, and they'd given it to this idiot so he could get across the border. And, and so anyway, uh, you know, that's a version of truth, which is uh, under certain circumstances you're capable of any, anything. And uh, uh, so Melville wrote, the, wrote that, and he lived in a kind of absolute silence uh, for a long time. I don't know, like how long, 25 years, 30 years, something like that. He went to work in the customs house in uh, New York Harbor. And um, he had a wife and he had children. He had one kid who was a drunk and a fuck up. And uh, uh the hell was his name? Stanwix, I think. Um, and the kid, he'd always get into fist fights, and the kid would book, and then it, so far, so he came back once. And he was trying to get sober, the kid, and uh, uh, they had their fist fight, and then Melville was filled with remorse, and and he got the kid a gig in the customs house, a tremendous, a wonderful job, where you just logged in, you know, entries and tried not to shoot yourself. So uh, so the day the kid, the kid was supposed to start work the next day and uh, he went out on a bender. And Melville was so pissed off that when he went to work the next morning, he didn't wake him up. And he came home and the kid had hung himself. Uh, 
And then at some point uh, between that event and his death, and it, it, which was uh, certainly 10 years later, maybe, maybe more, um, he went back to writing fiction. Uh, he, he had written a poem uh, called Billy and the Darbies, uh, which was about an old sailor uh, who was kind of losing his faculties and stuff. And he started working on it again. And, uh, and, and finished it, who knows when, because it wasn't found until I guess 30 years after Melville died, it was found in a trunk. They put it in the bottom of a trunk and they were going through it. And, uh, and by this time it was called Billy Budd. And the old sailor had become a young sailor who uh, had a, a handsome kid. In fact, it was called the, the subtitle or something about the handsome sailor, uh, who was the sweetest. He was an innocent. He 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 couldn't help but be what he was. Uh, he was, uh, as described in one passage, uh, much as Adam might have been. Ere the urbane serpent wriggled into his company. Innocent. Unable to choose between good and evil. Just had to be what he was. Uh, although there was one trait that he had, uh, he had a stammer. And it was. Uh, as if that same urbane serpent had left a calling card saying, I too have a hand here. So uh, he's on his ship. They're back on the ship. And the captain of the ship is a guy named Veer, which is kind of like truth. Uh, and um, it's said of Veer that... Uh, he, now, this is at the time, the narrator says, this is at the time of the Great Mutiny. And there was such a, it was, uh, uh, now, allegorists will say, well, they're talking about, you know, this is Satan, it's Adam, it's God, it's what, and, and that is simply a temptation of logic to control experience. Uh you can superimpose a historical construct and say the, the narrator is talking about the mutiny at the Nore. There was uh, uh, sailors, uh, w because the, the capitalism was still figuring itself out, you know, and these slave vessels, and uh, there, there was a tradition, you know, there were pirates. Everyone knows we don't like pirates until Johnny Depp. But uh, there was also a tradition that government vessels could raid private vessels on the high seas and impress the sailors on the private vessels into the Navy. And not surprisingly, a lot of the sailors didn't like that. And uh, there was a famous mutiny on the Nore where these sailors who had been impressed said, it's enough. And in the aftermath of the mutiny, the bosses, the people who ran the ships, the captains of industry and of vessels said, you know, we got to have discipline. People have to know their place. Uh, no matter what seems just or unjust in the world, you can't be run running off madly in all directions having a mutiny. Uh, and Veer was an apostle, uh, although a very fair-minded man, and very kind. Uh, they used to call him, his nickname was Starry Veer. 
because it always seemed as if he was looking off to the heavens for order, for a sense of order. And people spoke of that in a very favorable way. Although the narrator observes that a vision such as Veer's is sometimes far-reaching, like that of a migratory fowl, which in its flight fails to heed when it's crossed the frontier. Sometimes the bird doesn't look down, you know, it's just looking at the horizon all the time. So there's a guy on a ship, the master at arms, Claggart, and he hates Billy, and he can't even, he doesn't even know why. Um, he hates Billy's, what, innocence, which certainly can be confused for goodness. Uh, there's a chapter in there, I think, called Pale Ire, Envy, and Despair. And, uh, which I think actually first appeared in Paradise, in Milton's poem, Paradise Lost, in the description of Lucifer. But uh, the narrator observes of uh, Claggart, he just hated this kid, and he had to go after him. There's some vague imputation of a homosexual fixation, and certainly that's a shadow that cast itself across Melville's bow. Uh, Anyways, uh, Claggart accuses him of mutinous, uh, of incitement of the others, of the other sailors on board to mutiny. And uh, as if by Billy's very presence, as, as if the simple fact of, un, of an unfettered goodness is an incitement to mutiny against the arbitrary strictures and disciplines of the human organization. And he accuses Billy, and Billy's, the injustice of it, Billy tries to defend himself and veers there and he says, take it easy, take it easy, because he knows the kid's got a stammer and he, and, and he can't speak. And finally Billy hits veer and kills him. And uh, if ever there was an instance of an unfair accusation and of an act of violence which was compelled rather than chosen, which was Billy's act, certainly would seem to be that one. Uh, but Veer says he's got to go to trial because uh, it's at a time of troubles and the example of uh, a violent act against a superior officer which goes unpunished, you know, could be an incitement to further uh, violence. The narrator at that point meditates... Uh, trying to figure out what the fuck was going on in Claggart's mind. Uh, he said, apprehending the good, but powerless to be it, what was left for a personality such as Claggart's? But like the scorpion, for whom the creator is responsible, to turn in upon himself and act out to the end the part allotted. Uh, if there is evil, it would seem to be in the very fabric of the universe rather than residing in any particular soul. Anyways, they try Billy and uh, he's condemned to hang. And uh, Fear goes in and he tries to... Uh, Apology. He tries to ask for Billy's forgiveness. And uh, that's a scene of which uh, we are deprived. The scene is described uh, from a point of view of one who was not within. Uh, and then he's hung and there's all kinds of 
allegorical invitations to see him as a Christ figure, to see, you know, the birds fly up and his body takes the rosy dawn. Uh, all sorts of inauthentic ways of trying to control sorrow through epistemology, through knowledge, through logic, through allegory, through all, all that stuff. Now don't forget this guy's kid hung himself. And Melville said, fuck him. You know, I've done, you know, he's got to learn the way the world is. If you don't wake up on time, it's on you. Um, now, how fully did uh, he believe that? Well, how fully does anybody believe one thing? Maybe if you publish a story like that, you feel, I am justified. But in the complication of art, possibly if you feel, it's not for me to know what is justified and what isn't. Let me put it here for God to find or not and to decide what the meaning of life is. Because right the other way, I cannot. Um, so that uh, that's what storytelling, that's what's available to you, you know, uh, I don't know that it gets any rougher than that, uh, but uh, one might suggest that uh, he had come to rest with a full transparency in the spirit which gave him rise. And a full transparency doesn't understand uh, guilt or forgiveness or innocence. There's a wonderful line in a poem uh, that Mr. Warren wrote. Uh, Try and understand the the relationship of the artist to to the world, to life. Uh, Mr. Warren was uh, was was my teacher. Was was uh, he was obsessed with Audubon, the uh, you know the guy that painted the birds. Now he painted those birds in like 1800, and, and in Kentucky. He was a French guy, and he came over and he lived in the woods for like 25 years, murdering birds and painting them. What the fuck is that about? Uh, and Mr. Warren, who was a Kentucky boy, and which is where uh, Audubon was spending his time, and, and so that kind of fanciful connection to him and uh, so the poet says he slew them uh, at surprising distances with his gun. Um, their footless dance was of the beautiful liabilities of their nature. They knew no compassion. And if they did, we would not be worthy of it. Over, his, over their bodies, his head would be bent low, but not in sorrow. He drew them in imagination. What is love? One name for it is knowledge. And uh, I'd suggest in knowledge, remember, Knowledge is defined as love. Uh, it's not knowledge as, as we sometimes discuss it. Now, um, 25 years in the woods and very, very uh, happy or something compelled to be there. Uh, 
because that was the environment which was necessary for him to be true to his passion. And um, uh, I've, I've tried to suggest to you uh, in talking about some of these artists that um, there is no solitude, there is no isolation, there is no sense of guilt or sin or confusion uh, which cannot be refined of its fanciful connection and recognized as love. Uh, being on a strike, feeling that uh, your axe has been taken away from you. You know, um, remember that the great writer Paul said, "You know, be still and know that I am God." Uh, don't try and extrapolate from your momentary sense of isolation or solitude a fucking worldview. But leave, leave that to God. You know, just walk through the moment, and and uh, if it's pencils down, you know, if you're that kind of, uh, you know, then it's pencils down. I don't use a fucking pencil. Now, there's no act of solidarity. There's there's no betrayal of our brotherhood. If we're talking, right? That's okay. Uh, to the extent when we talk, we rest transparently in the spirit which gave all of us rise. We are still in the moment of art. So nothing has ended. You know, not, nothing, no future is precluded. Uh, Anybody who's going to starve to death, give me a fucking call. You know, uh, don't catastrophize. Uh, everything's going to be okay. Um, sometimes I think that in a previous incarnation I was a seal. <laughs> That's unlikely. Ooh, ooh. Oh no. Uh, so what time is it? You know, we're, 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 nobody's running a clock on us. You want to talk a little? Anybody want to ask a question? No. He never got the whale, but he got a new pair of shoes. The whale got him. You know that thing? Some days you get the bear, some days the bear gets you. The whale got him. <laughs>